So this week's Friday Tractor Story, I'm here with Jerry Nikolai. And Jerry has uh, grew up on a farm, but he's been involved with International Harvester and Case International Service since what year? I've been there for 55 years. I started in 1968. So 1968, uh, when a 656 was new, and a 1256 yep. was new. Yes, yes, yep. And the dealership that you worked at originally? Was, was Balls Motor and Implement in Hastings. Yep, and Balls wasn't just an international harvester dealer, were they? No, they did sell Plymouth and Chrysler cars. Uh, before I started working there, they also sold Dodge pickups. They would do that stuff. Uh, Balls Motor um, had a tire center that We'd sell quite a few tires and stuff. They did have a appliance store selling refrigerators, wash machines, stuff IH, like that. IH all IH, yes, all IH. Um, they did start in Old Cottage Grove, and at that time they were uh, doing horse and buggy type repairs in that area, did some uh, horse drawn plows and different things like that. And then they moved down to uh, Hastings, which they were located down on 2nd Street. Um, and then that's when they started selling, uh, say, your 1020s, F20s, stuff like that in there. Um, then back, um, I think possibly it was late 50s, somewhere in there, they moved up on Highway 61 where the Walmart is, or Walgreens is at this time. And from there, that's when they were selling cars, trucks, light trucks, um, all agricultural stuff. They did sell 13 different lines of agricultural equipment. It's Bobcats, uh, different skid steers, uh, Oatana, equipment, stuff yep. like this. They did all of that kind of stuff. So imagine in 1968, walking into the International Harvester dealer and picking out, uh, you know, say a Hemi GTX or Roadrunner and a brand new 1256. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I always talked to my former boss, uh, was Don Balls, and I says it seemed real uh, funny people would come and buy or start working at Paul's Motor and within a couple months they were bought a car or something like that. I says it really seemed funny. You paid them guys to work and at the same time you had money coming back to you because <laughs> they bought a car from you. Yeah. So Yeah and, and and back then so were they did they stock a lot of cool stuff? Or were all muscle cars special order? Um, muscle cars, no. They did stock muscle cars. Uh, they didn't sell the, they would sell the Hemis and stuff like this. And they would only do that on a special order stuff of that kind of Because the Hemi was, a, that was an expensive option. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I bought, our, well, I did buy a Roadrunner from them in 1970. And I had that all set up for a Hemi car and stuff like this here. And with the Hemi and stuff in it, I would have had somewhere it's around forty-six, forty-seven hundred uh, hundred dollars. Um, I had to take the Hemi back out because of parentable <laughs> reasons, <laughs> and uh, I left the car the way it was and stuff from that. But I still had. Um, a car that cost me over $4,100. That car had nothing but go fast stuff on it. It had AM, FM radio, and that's all that was in it. Bench seat, four speed? Bench seat, four so speed, no, no power had... steering, no power brakes. It was all go fast. So it was an A833 uh, yes. non council four speed. So you just had a big pistol grip? Yes. That That's yes. the best yep. look. Yeah, that... I had that. Um, the suspension and stuff was all a Hemi suspension. Uh, cooling system was Hemi. It was all a Hemi car, but I had to take the motor out and go to a 383. 
And you had a Dana 60. Yes, I did. And a Dana 60 and a 383 car is? That, I don't the, know if there's any around. Right. Yeah. And that uh, gear ratio was, um, three. I think it was 354. And there was three different gear ratios, and that was the smaller one. Okay. So you I, could it, you could drive it. I mean, it was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, we drove, yeah, we, we drove it. Um, the top speed that I could get on it, I don't know if you want to even know that, but was just about 140 mile an hour on the speedometer. Yeah. Yeah. So it had, so it, yeah, in 70, it had the round gauges. So you had 150 mile an hour speedometer. Sure did. Sure yep. did. Yeah. We're yeah. on a 68 or 69 with the sweeping speedometer, only 120, right? Yes, you're right. Yep. So yep, you're right. Because a, a, my favorite speedometer to ever put in a Mopar is either a um, 68 or 69 Coronet RT or, or a GTX because they mm -hmm. have a 150 mile an hour yep. speedometer, but it's sweeping. And the numbers yeah. are so close together <laughs> yes. when you get way over with that yep. needle. It's, yep, they just uh, kept going back or closer together, stuff yeah. like that. But um, yeah, it, uh, it was. It had to be uh, a magical time. Yeah. I mean, to because new turbocharged farm tractors, I mean, horsepower yeah. was going up. Yep. And yeah, the 1206 has come with turbochargers and they've been going on ever since. Then um, the, we did, I did personally myself at work, I'd put turbochargers on quite a few tractors over the years. Were you selling M&W too? M&W, yeah. Well, I made my own conversions and stuff pretty much. I'd get the M&W kit and then I'd use my own turbos and stuff. Okay. Yeah, because M&W's turbo wasn't. Uh, the Ray J, um, it would help and stuff like this, but if you went air research or something, or solar. That. Could you, you get solar you, through solar, the parts department? Yeah, solar was pretty much on the 1206s and yep. stuff like that. And then the Schweitzer went in on the uh, 1456 yep. is where they went. The solar was just in that 1206 is the only time I've seen that. Yeah. So all kinds of horsepower. Did, speaking of the M&W thing, did you ever sell any M&W pans? The M and W one oil pans. Oil pans? No, I did not. Because they were did. really expensive, yeah, and they're no, very rare. Yeah, no, I I never did that. Um, no doubt we'd put on extra filters and stuff for the turbocharger stuff like that. Pyrometers. But, yeah, pyrometers. Yeah, you would do that, but I never did nothing like that. We did back in the day when the letter series and stuff were out. We used M and W pistons and stuff like that. Yep, the fire craters. Yep. And, yes. Um, yeah. Boy, yeah. That like I said, that had to be a magic time. And in late '60s, early '70s, so that store was in downtown Hastings. Yes. Now, if somebody drives by, it's the Walgreens today. Yeah. But. For all practical purposes, Hastings has basically become a suburb of Minneapolis-St. Paul. It's getting close to that, isn't it? It's yeah. It's getting really close. Um, but when I first started working there, you had out on the front of the store and stuff like that, you had used cars and stuff right alongside the street. Your new cars were all inside. All the new cars were kept inside. So if you were coming to look at a car, you had to go inside. Uh, trucks and stuff were out front. We had those out front. We had some uh, tractors out front, but mostly cars and pickups were out front at that time. That would have been in the 60s. Yep. And right on Highway 61. Right on 61, yes. So 61, now, so you work all, all week, you know, working on farm equipment. Yes. What was Saturday night like in the summertime on Highway 61 in Hastings? <laughs> that was when the cars come out. We had quite a few cars that would run up and down that 61. The cops leave like you that. alone, go stoplight to stoplight? Um, you knew how long you could be out there and stuff like that. <laughs> you usually had yourself somewhere around 20 to 30 minutes, and then you had to go park them for a while. Okay. But, yeah, we, yeah, we did that. We had some pretty healthy cars back in those days. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so. And before I forget, Balls did sell a few Hemi cars. Yes, they did. Yeah, it was only uh, special order stuff like that. That's the yep. only they, they did. Um, they sold 
quite a bit of satellites and stuff uh, back in the day, say the GTXs. Yep. Um, they had 440s in right. and stuff 444 like that. 444 barrel. Yep, exactly. Until 70, or well, 69 and a half is when the six barrel. Come out on the rotor on the S. So did they do any lift off hood 69 and a half side of the store, you think? No, I, no, I don't think we sold any six packs out of that store. Okay. No. Did, and did they ever sell a Sport Fury GT? Yes. Oh, those are a beautiful yeah, car. They're so pretty. underrated, they're pretty. aren't they? Yeah, they're pretty. Yeah. Um, they did sell a, quite a few uh, Furies and stuff to the highway department uh, police and stuff like this here. Yeah. So if you could grab one of them, that was something to have because they, they were pretty powerful. 440 Commandos. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Heavier set suspensions and everything. So did you ever go, so my parents, um, my parents bought their farm in the 80s and my dad, my grandpa left the home farm in Michigan when my dad was little. Uh huh. Dad would always go help on the farm, but he grew up uh, in Minnetonka, back when it was okay. still in Chanhassen, back when yeah. it was rural. Yeah. Um, and he always talked about like him and mom in the early 70s and stuff like that. They would all go to like Minnesota dragways. Yeah. Yeah. Spent a little bit of time there. Uh, my wife spent more time there than I did. <laughs> she, she's a motorhead. Okay. And uh, yeah, she she loves that kind of stuff. But Minnesota dragways, yeah, we spent a fair amount of time there. And then that basically got sold out. And then we went to Brainerd from there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, what a what a wonderful time. And, and we'll, we'll get back to the farm equipment here. But, um, <laughs> So the 56 series is, you're a young guy right out of high school and you're working on 56 series. Yep. Did they, and they would train, IH, Balls would send you to IH yeah. school for stuff? All of my training and stuff for the international stuff was all done by international harvester themselves and stuff. We'd go to like uh, one week school, stuff like this here. We would learn uh, engines, fuel systems, transmissions, hydraulics. We did a fair amount of stuff right up in the cities uh, is where we did some of it. Uh, we went down to Hickory Hill and also we were out into South Dakota. We went out there a few times for schooling, okay. stuff like that. So the, so it's 68, like I said, the 1256. Balls probably sold a few 1256s. Yes, we sold quite a few of those, yes. I don't know the number on it, but I would say probably a couple dozen or so. Okay. But I bet was would have been like an 856, probably the bread and butter at the time. A lot of At 8s. that time, yes, yeah, so 856, we sold just tons of that. We sold quite a bit of uh, 806s, um, but the 856, like you said, the bread and butter that, that we yep. sold a ton of those. The Hastings area, and, and you guys were on the Wisconsin side of the river too. Yes. A lot. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, so Prescott, uh, yeah. up to New Richmond, that area. Ellsworth was probably tough for you guys back then because of Julian Walsingham. Yeah. Julian Walsingham pretty much took care of Ellsworth stuff like this here. What we did is when we went out into Wisconsin, we would head up into River Falls, uh, New Richmond in that area. Yep. Uh, we did go as far south as down to Austin and stuff like that, selling uh, that area. But um, Larson was... Uh, Larson at that time that we are talking about right now, they were case Just only. strictly case, okay. Yeah. Yep. And then uh, they come in when uh, basically when we went into Case IH is when okay. they started coming in. Okay, because I thought maybe, was there a, was there an IH dealer in like Zambroda or? There was one in Zambroda right off of Highway 52 yep. just on the north end, yeah. Yep. There was one there uh, that was um, Roble and Nord. And they got, eventually they were bought by Larson. Larson, Larry Larson did buy it out at the okay. end when they quit. And then uh, when Larry got, had those two stores and he just grew up, at, uh, kept going on and on with them. Um, he's right now, Minnesota Ag Group has 
four full stores and a parts store uh, out in the country and stuff like this. Here we go anywhere from Minnes from Hastings, Plainview, um, Northfield, Zambroda. Kenyon, right? Yeah, and Kenyon, yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so, yeah, and, and back back to the early 70s then. So then 1970 rolls around. Mm -hmm. 1456 comes 1456 out. 1456 come out uh, and... 1026, right? We had 1026 the year after the 14 come out. Yep. They come out a year later. And uh, then, uh, no doubt, the 856 was there, the 756, stuff like this here. And then when that went down, uh, went away, then we come up with the uh, 66 series, which would have been 666, 766, 966, 1066, 1466. And at the end, we had 1566 yep. also. But back to like the 1456 and the 1026. Yep. The gold demonstrator program. Yes, yes, they had uh, gold demonstrators on the 1456, uh, 826, and uh, you, 1026. 1026 also, yes. And even 656 and 544 if they were hydro. Um, they were hydros, yeah, you could yep. get hydros, yes. So there was no, nobody kept track of the serial numbers of what models were the gold demos. So this, to this very right. day, it's hard to keep track. It's hard to, it's hard to, to trace that down, yeah. And every IH dealer had to have at least one gold demo. Right. Do you remember what the gold demo was? The that first Balls one that had? we got? That was a 544 and a 826. Hydro. Hydro, Hydro. or gear drive? Um, that was a gear drive. Okay. Yeah, that was gear drive. Because there's actually an original paint 826 gold demo yeah. coming I up for sale so. right now. Really? Cool. Yeah. But it's original paint because a lot of times people fake them. It, it's easy yeah. to fake you just because they were supposed to be painted back to yeah, if red. You, yeah, if you would okay, a gold demo had gold underneath the hood, stuff like this here, and you'll see people that'll paint them gold and not finish out everything, yeah. so you can find them and stuff the real ones. Yep. So you but. can pick that up. So, yeah, if somebody tells you that they've got a gold demo that was sold new in Hastings, Minnesota, a 544 and an 826 were both sold. Yeah, it? yeah. Uh, Ralph McCaddy bought uh, the 826, and I don't know who got the 544 now. Okay. But that's, yeah, that's pretty neat that, uh, you know, you can remember when that. Yeah. So then you're, you're a young guy yet and into horsepower, right? Oh, I love it. So the 66 series comes out. Yes. And you, were you following any tractor pulling back then? Like, because tractor pulling started to get pretty popular. Tractor pulling, like you said, about in that 70 area, stuff like that is when that started to get pretty popular and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, uh, we followed the tractor pulling and stuff like that. And uh, Found out that that cost an awful lot oh, yeah. of money. We backed off on that. But were you, uh, was it something else then when the 1066 and the 1466 come out and Jerry Lagarde is selling, you know, starts Hypermax engineering and, you know, and twin yeah. turbo in these tractors. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, because yeah. you can turn up a 12 or a 1456 and get a lot of power. Yeah, but, you can do that. Yeah, it, those tractors were very, it was very easy to get power out of them. The, probably the tractors that you could get the best horsepower out of them was the 66 yes. series. They, they would go nuts. They, you could get them up pretty high. Yeah. Um, the 56 series, you would have to do some work on the injection pump, stuff like that, to get them to come around. Yep. And to bring that up and stuff like that. But the, you, the 56 series was very durable. Yeah, very durable. Uh, the actually the 806 are we've got those out to the this day that they have not had the engine overhauls or anything on them. No doubt we've done clutches and stuff yep. like that, but there are some of those around that never had the engine torn apart. Yeah, 856s are very durable. Um, they. 
uh, they held in there just as well as an 06, yep. as far as that goes. They're a, I mean, they're a strong tractor too. I mean, they're for naturally aspirated. And so in my, my experiences, uh, I always thought an 856 would almost run better than a 966 because yes. they, they handled, be, the, nine, six, the 400 series engine was designed for a turbo, so a 966 non-turbo non is kind of lazy. Deal. Yeah, the 966 was, like you said, it would, didn't have quite the torque and stuff like they had on the 56, 806, stuff like this here. Uh, they would pull their basic horsepower and stuff was there, but they didn't have the torque rise is what they should have had. The torque rides really come into effect on the 1066, 1466, the ones with turbos. Yep. Uh, they had very uh, big torque rises and stuff on them. So did Balls, speaking of non-turbo, did Balls sell any 1468s? Yes, yes, not a terrible lot of them. Uh, I would say we probably sold maybe uh, 10 to a dozen of them. Uh, I would also say that half of them had turbochargers put on them after the effect. For, that's with the uh, stuff from Ball's Motor in, uh, in Hastings. Did you get um, the M&W kits? To yeah, twin those turbo? we used M&W kits to do that, yes. And uh, that brought the horsepower around better because the V8, uh, they would fall on their face quite easily comparing to an inline six. Right. And uh, once you put the turbo on, it made a whole new cat. Yeah, but they didn't last the reliability on those tractors. Um, the last, the engines on the uh, 68s and stuff like this here didn't last as good as what the 06, 56 inline uh, they they didn't stand up nearly as well. We had more problem with those yep. than what we would like to talk about. Yep. So the 66 series was was great. I mean, success for IH. Yeah. yeah. Um, the only thing that gave us a little bit of trouble with them is we didn't have a real sound proof cab like with some of the other tractors and stuff, and that hurt us. There's no doubt about yeah, that. Yeah, well, when you started in 68, um, it was kind of a neck and neck race yes. with Deer and IH. Yes. But Deer was coming up, they were gaining market they share. Were, they were picking up on us, there's no doubt, yes. Because that Soundguard cab was, it was light years ahead of the, the yeah. IH cab at the, the time. Soundguard cab is what brought them in, stuff like this, as far as getting uh, the engine and the hydraulics and uh, drivetrain, we were still far above them as far as I'm concerned, but um, that Soundguard cab just kicked our butt a little bit for a while. Yep. So then the Black Stripes come out. Now, did you figure they were up to something when they changed the, to the Black Stripe? Black Stripe, when they first, when they come out, they changed the torque curve and stuff on them. Um, they, the, probably the biggest thing was is they started switching some stuff over to metric uh, fasteners and stuff like that. Your front axle was metric. Things like this here uh, was real uh, evident on what was going on with the black stripe. But that's about when all this come out in the uh, switch over yeah, to metric system. And, and the, the black stripe is kind of the transition into the 86 series. Yeah, yes it would be. Um, it's still, it sat there for a year or so, but uh, when the 86 series come out, that's when we come with a uh, soundproof cab type deal. Um, basically had a lot of the same uh, engine type stuff, a transmission, everything like this here. We stayed with all that in the 86 series. So. The 86 series is kind of controversial. I, I remember reading A Corporate Tragedy and they talked about that, that dealers were disappointed by the 86 series because they, they wanted to have a nice cab, but they were looking for an updated transmission and stuff, finally to have like a power shift in that. Right, That yeah, because all we had for a power shift was a torque amplifier, which was high and low basically. Um, they were concerned about that. 
one of the big things that I heard a lot of is the hydraulic system. Um, the, some of the other uh, manufacturers had closed centered systems. Yep. We did not have that until the last year and a half yeah, uh, the, of the 86 series. Yeah, the. And then the, we come with those. With the tri stripe. Yeah. Yeah, yep, with that's PFC. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, so did you like the 86 series or were you kind of. I mean, because today it almost seems like people will pay more for a 1066 than they will a 1086. <laughs> yeah, they will. The 86 series tractors, I liked them very well. I, th I liked them really. Um, but. It wasn't the old style. They were trying to get into the new style stuff right. like this here. And uh, they held, worked with that. We had some sale problems a little bit in the 86 series. Uh, then when we come out with the Magnum, that's when everything comes yeah, together. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get to that. That's okay. a biggie. Uh, but uh, do you remember the, the IH, uh, the 79 program, the, the hottest brand, or make IH your brand? Where oh, they put the branding with iron the decals? branding iron and stuff on. Yeah. They were, I believe, 81 model tractors, if I remember right. 79. I think. So, okay, could have been Because they were, um, they have the same decals as a regular 86 series, but they painted the, the radiator they panel red. They had a red. stripe on them. In the decal going down the side of it, they had... Uh, you had black, kind of a reddish orange. Nope. That was the 81s. Yep. So the 79s right. were the red power special. Yes. Where they just had the regular 86 series decal, but the lower panel was painted red instead of white. The lower panel on the side was painted right and had a branding yep. iron on them. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, and I think if I remember right, uh, did Randy Hooper have a 1486 that was one of those uh, red power specials? Whoa, could be. I don't know for sure, really. I can't answer that. I thought so. I would have guessed maybe Randy would have bought that from you guys back in the day, or maybe he got at it that from time, Julie Walsingham. Oh, he could have got it from Walsingham at that time, yet they're still there then yet. So, so that could be. That would have been Hoika, I would assume. Hoika came, yeah, when did Hoika start? Somewhere in that yeah, time frame. Right in that frame, yep. yeah, yeah. So IH... As we're coming into the 80s, um, uh -huh. did you know IH Company? Because growing up, for you, I mean, International Harvester was as big as General Motors and Caterpillar almost. I mean. Yeah. The, yeah. And it just started to fall apart. Did you know that they were in trouble? Yeah. Okay. It wouldn't let on to it, though. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I knew that. So then the, the, the 50 series tractors come out, the STS yeah tractors were you pretty excited about those that uh they were a very big jump. yeah they when they first come out and stuff with that with the tri six transmission and stuff on them um that was one of the biggest jumps that international did for a long long time uh because they come up it was all synchronized you could do everything and anything you wanted to it uh, except shift into reverse. You had to stop to shift into reverse and stuff like this. The hydraulic system was above anybody else's at that time. They're a closed center system, but the output and stuff that we had uh, was better than what anybody else was around. Yeah, and they, um, they had really went out of their way to try yeah, and listen yeah. to the customers. I mean, they had optional interiors like... You could get a Western yeah. interior, you could... Yeah, you could get the uh, regular black uh, interior, you get Western interior, or you could get burgundy. Yep. Yeah. Did they sell a lot of 88s? 88s? Um, I guess I'd have to say yes. Because if I remember right, I think there were a couple over in our area that were sold out of this way. I think uh, uh, maybe O'Neill's had one. It was like a, did Bailey Nurseries lease tractors or did Bailey some... Nurseries lease tractors from us. In fact, they still do now, except they don't do the big tractors anymore. Uh, but yes, they would. Um, would they, like a 50, because there were a couple of 5288s that I thought were. Yeah, came yeah to they, our area they had 3688, stuff like that also. Okay. They had, uh, they would get 
quite a few tractors from us. Um, they're, oh, somewhere around 15, 20 a year okay. that they would lease from us. So then the lease returns were pretty oh, yeah, reasonable. That was, that, yeah, when we'd get lease returns come back, that was an easy sell. Yeah. Yeah. So I think a couple of 5288s ended up over across the river. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yep. Yeah, I'm sure. What about two plus twos? Two plus two was... Because they came out, what, 79? Yes. Yes. Um, two plus two, it was... how They got sold improperly, maybe. But two, they, that was a row crop type four-wheel drive tractor, is what that was originally. And uh, that's why the steering and stuff was the same as what you're talking, the long nose and stuff on yep. it. Because you could hook them onto a baler, chopper, or anything like that. And you could go out and do PTO work and stuff like this, and you had no trouble uh, turning on the ends or staying on the row or anything like this. This is what that tractor was basically for, a row crop four-wheel drive tractor. Um, and a lot of people took and bought those and they started putting duels on the front and the back. Um, that didn't work uh, at all. We had driveline problems yep. on that. And then finally, after a while, we got them just to put the duels in the back and let it alone. And that seemed to work pretty decent, uh, that kind of stuff. But um, it still was a row car up type tractor. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't a forty five eighty six. No, it, it wasn't. wasn't yeah, you know, it wasn't 43. a. Yeah, it wasn't a pull tractor as uh, big heavy tillage and stuff like that. It was more for doing PTO the, work. Yeah, I think what ended the two plus two was a mechanical front wheel drive that would turn. Yeah. That because that's basically what they were before. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and uh, yeah, when we come with the mechanical stuff, then that pretty much blew them away. But um, the drive line just wasn't built to do heavy tillage and stuff because it was basically a PTO drive tractor. They work very well for that kind of stuff, but they got over mis misused. Yeah, which farmers will do. Oh yeah, yeah, and we had problems in our sales departments and stuff like this here, and uh, all of the dealers that had that problem, they would try to sell these as a four-wheel drive tractor, not a PTO type tractor, and that was not a good deal. Which, if you had a 1486 mm -hmm. and you turned up the pump, two-wheel drive is still going to slip enough to. Oh yeah, it'll live. Right. Yeah. Um, when. Uh, when they come out with the two plus two, uh, what dealers had the impression that they could sell it as a agricole as a regular four wheel drive tractor, and it just it killed them. Yeah, is what it did. So did did Ball sell quite a few two plus twos? The first couple years, yeah, we did, we did. And uh, people started using them like what I was saying. Yeah. And they were having trouble. Um, the front axle and stuff was not built heavy enough to do what they were trying to do with yep. them. And they had trouble with it. And the drive line going up to the front axle and stuff. So they got a bad name, basically. They got a bad name, you bet. But did that, having a 2 plus 2 out there where you had guys that didn't, want to jump into a four-wheel drive tractor, then they get the two plus two and they realize having a four-wheel drive, they could do more. Did that end up selling some uh, 4586s, 4386s? Oh, yeah. You know, the people that had those uh, two plus twos, they pretty much went into a regular four-wheel drive tractor, like say the 41, uh, 43s, 66s, different things like that. Um, yep. They would go into that kind of stuff so they could have for their tillage. So, uh, that kind of work for them, yeah. Did you guys sell a lot of 4186s and 4166s? At one, at one time we sold a fair, it was quite a few. That was in the 66s. Okay. 56, we sold one of them that I know of. And those were the yellow? They were yellow. They had 429s in them. 
Yep. Uh, went down to Lake City is where that went. Bruce Bang had a 4186, I think. And I wonder if yes. that came from, that yes, did come from you. Yes, it was a 4166. Okay. Is what he had. Okay. So. Huh. That's interesting. Because, yeah, I suppose when somebody bought a tractor like that, it was like, whoa. That's, oh, uh, it was a big guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought it was an acre farmer back then was yeah. massive. Yeah. And uh, it just, when they, with the four-wheel drives and stuff like this, they kept getting more popular than what every year. It just, yeah. just about all you see. You do see MFDs and stuff like that. You see a lot of them also. Did, did Balls ever sell Steiger before Case IH? No. Okay. Okay. No. So the four-wheel drive stuff was just the IH four-wheel drives? Yep. Yeah. And uh, I suppose when, you st when the four-wheel drive started getting popular, uh, it started to stress the shop a little bit because the shop wasn't built for... That's the reason why we had to build a new shop. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Our our shop, we had a lot of square footage and stuff in our shop, but we didn't have the overhead doors and stuff on them to do that. Right. So. So then, um, what about what about combines? Because what I've always heard is that the IH combine wasn't super popular. At, like almost like the 915s gave them a bad name, and um, then the axial. Once the axial flow came out, IH combine market share. Right. When the, uh, they come out in 77, and that's when the combine stuff went for us wild. We had like 403s, 715s, 815s. The, let's say the 403s, 715s, they were quite popular. The 815 and 915 uh we sold them but not near as much of those okay so then the, yeah the axial flow comes out and suddenly you guys are working on combines quite a bit now yes and, uh, yeah yeah right now at the time when the axial flow come out and stuff like this here uh we sold quite a few of them, stuff like that um but today with minnesota ag group when I retired, I had a, uh, uh, a setup that we were doing about 50 combines a year. So that was quite a bit. Oh, yeah. 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 And in the, before the axial flow, I mean, how many combines, uh, new combines a year would you guys even sell? Bef just a sec. What, say it again. So before the axial flow, um, how many new combines a year would balls even sell? Um, before the axial flow and stuff like this, we'd probably sell one or two. Yeah. So this yeah. was a big change. This was the... a big change, big, big change. And when they come out with that, then it, yeah, it just changed. Yeah. Combines became a big, big part of the business when before yeah. it was just a, you know, yeah. which yeah. in, in the area was probably changing. Cause when you started Hastings was probably a lot of smaller dairy farms because like the creamery uh, yeah. was there. So Hastings was smaller dairy farms. You had yeah. a creamery there yeah, and stuff. Yeah, back, um, back like in the 60s, 70s, stuff like this here, we had dairy farms that were say 400, 500 acres, stuff like that. And today all of these farms are basically sold out or people are renting stuff like that. Most of our uh, farmers and stuff like this are doing 2,000 plus, even 5,000, 6,000 in the Hastings area. It, so back in the 70s and 80s and stuff like this, yeah, the dairy farms were more like the uh, 500 acres. Yep. Stuff like that. Th things changed, and and then seed production got big around here. Yeah. Too, yeah. and it, yeah. it it just changed. Every everything totally changed. Yeah, uh, the dairy farms. Uh, we've there's one or two dairy farms around Hastings area now, um, and uh, they're the bigger farms that are looking at a hundred cow herds or bigger, um, and anything like uh, cattle and stuff like this. They're, they're there, but they're raising much more cattle. 
Um, it used to be that if around Hastings, all the farmers and stuff that were there were family farms, stuff like this here. And yeah. now today it's not, it's all corporate. Yep. So that was a, that changed the machinery stuff. Oh yeah, the machinery, uh, as soon as they did that, people started farming much, many more acres, stuff like this here. So the machinery and stuff got totally big. And, and on the machinery end of it, uh, did you, early on, were you selling a lot of IH haying equipment? And... We did back in the uh, 60s, uh, 70s, we sold quite a bit of haying equipment, forager, harvesters, stuff like that. Then it started to die off, like uh, especially in the 80s, stuff like that, because all the farmers were uh, selling out, stuff yep. like that. So all that stuff started dying off. And now in the last four or five years, the uh, haying is coming back. Uh, but as far as going with uh, forage harvesting and stuff like that, it's still quite low. Yeah, so IH, when you, you know, we didn't talk much about the implements, but the IH implements that were pretty famous, IH was known for tillage equipment. Yes. 720, 710 plows, 700 plows. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you must have sold it. We sold a ton of those. Uh, the IH plow seemed as though it would uh, pull easier, scour easier than what a lot of the other aftermarket, other farmers would, our uh, dealers would have stuff like this here. And they, they had a better automatic reset. Yes, they had a better automatic reset. The Vibershank uh, tillage, yeah. that worked, that just went nuts. Yeah, a Vibershank 45 with a harrow on the back was a yeah, beautiful. That was it, that was it. Right? Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. The, the 496 disc, they yes. had a good disc. Yeah, that disc, yeah. When that first come out, stuff like this, that was, uh, it was, it was a heavy disc and it still is and stuff like this here. But um, what we had to do shortly after they come out, we had to get uh, cushion gangs and stuff like this here uh, because we we're having trouble with disc breakage and arbor bolts and stuff bending because the disc was heavy and would penetrate the ground decently. Uh, so rock. we, yeah, rocks are not good. And we had to go in with cushion gang and that's what the reason why we did that. Okay. All right. So, oh, short line companies, were you selling like, uh, did you have any Gale or any of we, that? Yeah, we did Gale, we did Melro. Uh, we did some of the real small stuff like Lama skid steers, uh, stuff like this here. Um, but our short line that we really was Gale and Bobcat. Okay. Yep. So probably sold a lot of mix all, grinder mixer, yes. uh, Gale mix all 120s, 125s. Yes. Yes. And they yeah. had a good mill. Yeah. And uh, sold a lot of forage harvesters, stuff like this here. Yep. Back in the day on those. Yeah. The, um, it seems like you'd saw a lot of red tractors with a Gale. Uh, for yeah. harvester. Yeah, it kept the red going. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, and the deer had a good chopper, but it just didn't work as good with an IH tractor. They just, with the with the hydraulic controls and stuff. It yeah, just... John Deere hydraulic and stuff was all by itself pretty much. Yeah. So it, and uh, it's getting better now that we can pull back, back and forth like this here, but back in the day, like what we're talking, um, yeah. John Deere is John Deere, and that's what it had to be. Yeah. So the the Cyclo Planner. Yeah. When they came out, because um, the fifty six Planner was fairly, you know, people like that fifty six Planner. I yeah. think, right? When when the Cyclo Planner come out, uh, it took a little bit before it caught on and stuff like this here. But after a period of time, they found that this planner. Uh, was very adaptable to crops. Uh, the maintenance and stuff was real good, stuff like that. And we kept with that 400, 500, stuff like that. When we come out with the 800 planter, we had a little bit of uh, problems and stuff with that. And after we got 800 series is gone, we went into the 900 and stuff. 
things st uh, stayed very well with the airtight planner. And uh, today, this is what it still is. And uh, pretty much all your companies are going with the airtight planner. So that was a good thing. It just That was a good thing. It just took time for it to ca right. catch on. Right. Okay, so now it's, it's 1985, mm -hmm. and you find out that Tenneco has bought International Harvester Farm yep. Division. Yep. What did you think? <laughs> that, to start out with that, uh, it was not a real good deal. There was uh, things going on between Case and uh, International Harvester that people were not getting along very well, stuff like this here. Uh, it seemed like a, a bad deal. Um, were you were you afraid you were going to lose your job? Because there was a there was a case dealer in Hastings at one time too, wasn't there? Yes, there was. There was one north of it, of us uh, up on top of the sixty one hill. Um, but no, not we were not really too worried about it in Hastings. As far as that goes, uh, we pretty much figured we were going to get the dealership, uh, stuff like that. Um, one thing that happened when we went from International Harvester and Case went on the merger, what they thought was going to uh, end up being that the international tractor was going to be a hard sell to get rid of them, stuff like this. So they went kind of like a barn burner type deal where, for selling them. And uh, they found out how many people liked the international tractor. The, the international tractor was sold out within a very, very short time. Uh, the case kind of hung in there for quite a while. Uh, they had to get some spiffs and stuff to get them to move, stuff like that. And uh, when they finally come with the Magnum tractor, which I've talked about before, yep. uh, that was the tractor of the day at that time. So that had, do you remember seeing your first Magnum come in? Yeah. Was it like, yeah. wow. This yeah, is... it was way, way different, let me tell you. Yeah. 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 That, that, they were tough. And they didn't have a lot of problems. They did not have many problems whatsoever. Uh, when they first come out, that they had a five-year warranty yeah. on them. So and I got to ask you about that because uh, when I was a kid, I spent about half my childhood on Don Roll's farm. Uh-huh. Do you remember Don Roll's 7120 Magnum and the problems that that one had? Don had turned that way, way up. You mean that... Uh, Serial number 2037, I think, is the last numbers on it. It could be, but I yeah. I think so. <laughs> it, it, it broke the main drive shaft off yeah. internally yeah. twice. Yeah. And no, he, he had, yeah. He had her crank to the, <laughs> I think. Uh, well, they come out hot. When they first come out, yeah. they were hot. And then people started turning them up after that, too. Yet, yeah, And uh, things, we had a little bit of problem, yeah. Well, the, <laughs> the first time it happened... They, he had a 618 Zonland hitch plow, yeah. and his kid was plowing um, at night, and it was like set aside they were plowing. So it was tall grass, and it was, you know, it was like late spring, so it wasn't muddy. It was, they had good traction, and yeah. he was going just as, as hard as that Magnum would go, and he said it started power hopping, and it hopped a couple times, and then it yep. just quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when they first come out, uh, with the Magnum and stuff like this, we did have what they call power hop. And at that same time, a lot of the uh, companies were having this kind of problem, stuff like this here, until they finally figured out how to ballast the tractor and get the air pressures and stuff right. And then the power hop all went away. We really don't have that problem anymore. But yeah, we did have a problem with that at one time, but um, that they, one they were hot. They were hot. <sighs> Yeah, because I, I think Lee Fiedler told me that, because uh, it broke once and then it broke again like a year or yeah. two later. Yeah. And the rep from Case IH came out, because of the five-year warranty, it was still yep. under warranty. Yep. And the rep from Case IH came out, and you guys put it on the dyno. And I think Lee Fiedler told me they were like at 250 or something like that. The yeah. tractor, the torque was still going up. Yeah, yeah they, were, they were wild. Yeah, you just, you just yep. shut it down, and the Case IH guy <laughs> said, that's the last warranty on this. <laughs> It's over now. Yeah. 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 That 
that uh, they got them calmed down and stuff. But yeah, it was not uncommon to see, uh, say, a 160 horse tractor coming out, 200 horse stuff like this here. And the big thing was on the five year warranty and stuff. What uh, Case IH, what they, and they did do it, what they wanted to do is come out with a tractor that would uh, have the horsepower, have the traction, it, that it was going to be a hot tractor. And we sold a lot of these tractors and uh, there was a lot of other companies that were really getting kind of skeptical on what Case IH was going, what was happening and stuff, because we sold a lot of tractors. We had a lot of things going on stuff when we come out with those tractors. And they were, they were selling as far as, I think they were pretty aggressive pricing wise. Like they were, yes, they offered rebates and yeah, they, yeah. So yeah, they, uh, they come out with, like you said, horsepower or the pricing and stuff was right. Uh, stuff like that. And they knew that they had themselves a tractor that would stand up the hydraulic system and stuff like that. There's no doubt we had some growing pains with it, just learning it and stuff like that. But, um, the tractor is really tough and today uh, people know that because the value and stuff on the first magnums and stuff are still very good. Yeah. Yeah. So then, I mean the magnum was the dominant tractor from late yeah. 80s. Everybody was saying uh, it's about time they come with an 806 tractor again. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. then 1995 deer comes out with that 8,000 series mm -hmm. deer and that changed the game where suddenly Case IH had to do something quick. They had to come together and get things happening and stuff like that. Yeah, because they kind of uh, went, they did their homework, put it that way. Yeah. So then the MX Magnum comes out. Mm -hmm. There was a few more problems with that than... The first year, they, we had a lot of problems. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that we did, and we got those ironed out, stuff on that kind of stuff, and we come out with the newer uh, Magnum, that the second series type, yep. and uh, that is still a good tractor. Yeah, the 210, the yeah. 230, yeah. the, yeah. yep. Yeah, and now the MX is dropped off of the model line yep. and stuff like this here, and it, it, They've got a tractor now that's working very yeah. well. The the common rail Cummins powered magnums, like the three oh five, the mm -hmm. two seventy five, those I mean yeah. do you think those are as good as the original boxcar magnums? Honestly, no. Okay. You don't gotta print that either. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I like the regular boxcar magnums the best. What about the 7150? Because when that came out, because that came out later than the rest of the Magnums. Yes. Yeah. 200 and, what, 215 horsepower. Yeah. That was nothing like that at yeah. the time. Yeah. Um, that tractor, we, to be honest, we didn't, as far as the Magnum tractors, we, after the first year when we got everything settled down and stuff like, we have never had problems with them really at all. Yeah, yep. yeah. They, they hang in there very well. But did you guys sell a lot of seventy one fifties? No, no, yes. we sold uh, probably a handful. Kevin Lindstrom had one. Did his maybe come from you guys? Probably. Okay. Probably, because he's he's gone through quite a few tractors. He has. Well, I, I think, and I don't know. Um, well, it, in the Magnum, uh, that boxcar Magnum era and time yeah. frame, there. Lapine's out of Menominee, Wisconsin, was pretty aggressive. I think Lapine's was very aggressive selling and stuff like this here. Yep. Um, and they they did a very good job of doing that kind of stuff. Uh, I would like to say that our technicians and stuff like this here were above most of the technicians out, and uh, we kind of had a, a lot of the dealer, a lot of customers coming back just because of our service department. Yep. 
Because I think Lapines, they were the number one Magnum dealer in the they country. They sold a lot. Yeah, they sold a lot, I, and uh, we serviced a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, I was just I was just talking with uh, Jared Nelson, um, and he was saying that Lapines he thought had three Mark Fifty Edition Magnums allocated to him, and there were only well, there was what forty four of each one uh -huh. built or something like that. So for them to have three was a lot. Did you guys get a Mark Fifty? Um, I can't answer that. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. That I don't know. So, yeah, the would you say like the Boxcar Magnum is probably one of your favorite IH tractors? Um, yeah. To go way back to the 06, that's the ones I really love. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The 06, 56, but after when they're gone, then when we come with the Boxcar Magnums, yeah, that's the ticket. Yeah. They're... It's a ticket, and uh, well, you can tell by the value, resale oh, value, it absolutely. just goes nuts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They uh, um, very identical to what yeah. the deer of the same era yeah. sells for. Oh yeah, yeah. A lot of times they'll sell a lot. Uh, they'd be a, a, a higher than them. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so that that '90s era tractor is phenomenal i mean yeah they were all really good yeah no, that, it, uh, yeah we actually everybody has their growing pains but we've come as far as i'm concerned we come through really decent throughout the whole session yeah. okay so then 1999 um you guys moved to a, a new building yes and then dropped the Chry chrysler plymouth yep drop Chrysler Plymouth, we dropped all of the automotive uh, as far as that goes. Um, the selling of tires, we, we sold tires, but we, it wasn't like what we were doing or anything. We basically were International Harvester and then Case IH at the end. Yep. That's all we did. We had Lawn and Garden. Uh, the Cub Cadets that they pulled away from us, stuff like that. Now we're selling uh, gravely and stuff like that. But um, that when we first moved out there, it was it was a big change. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, it was a big change. It, quieter. Quieter, yeah. And yeah, and we got enough room to do stuff and so, over there and stuff now. Right. Before we had a hard time getting things in our shop and stuff. Yep. So then when did Balls uh, sell to Minnesota A Group. Or 2008. What? Okay. Yeah. And was that a, that must have been a big change too. Just it to... was, it was. Uh, as I would say, yeah, it was a big, big change. Um, pretty much all of the employees stayed the same uh, for a period of time. Um, it's going through this, age uh, the stages and stuff like that we had people that were old enough to retire that they did retire stuff like that and uh in fact now that we're finding that's happening over at uh hastings now again that a lot of the people that are older retired are retiring i think we've got four people retiring right now yeah and it's so, harder, probably harder to find farm kids to be yeah, mechanics so now. Yeah, so it's going to, that'll, they're going to have to go through the whole build back, uh, build back up all their mechanics and stuff like that. Um, I did that quite a few years, for quite a few years yeah. in the si system that we had and stuff. But um, working in that shop is nice, very nice. Uh, when we first got there, uh, me and my technicians, we kept saying, boy, I wish we had the old shop back again because we we're just used to the old yep. shop, stuff like that. But, um, yeah, it's it's really nice. We, the overhead hoist and stuff that we've got, and it's air-conditioned as far as that goes now, too. Yeah, yep. So it it's a good place to work at this time. Yeah, yep. So, so now that you're retired, yep. you... Uh, do you miss it? For a while. And uh, yeah, for a while. 
the biggest thing that I missed was my employees. Yep. My techs and stuff like that. I miss them. Um, and we just get together, talk back and forth, stuff like that. But yeah, I missed it. Yes. Yeah. But I'm sure there's, you could tinker on as many old tractors as you wanted, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. So of all the tractors you got or over the years, why do you, why do you keep a 656? Why do I, I, I just like a 656. It, uh, it, it's, yeah, it's, it, it out of all the tractors, this is the right size for me for what I'm doing here, but I just like this type of tractor. I, I really like it. Yeah. I really yeah. like it. And the 656, kind of odd because they made them for a long time because they came, they were making them when they were making the 06 series. Yep. yep. And they made them when they were making the 66 series. Yep. So that's a, I don't know how many years total. It had to be eight, nine years. Oh, it? for sure. It's for sure that. Um, it's, you know, the tractor is very comfortable to drive, easy to drive uh, is the reason I like it. it it's just, uh, yeah, it just grew on me. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, and this one's a diesel. Yes. Um, did they fix the... The 560s were known for head, head gasket, gasket problems. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That Was the 656 fixed. better? Very much so. Yeah. Um, especially when they come with the uh, uh, press fit sleeves and stuff like this, they got a better fire dam on the top of the uh, sleeve and uh, that situation. The cooling system, uh, we upgraded that. Uh, what we did, did is. The, uh, we got hot spots in between the block and the cylinder head. Yep. And we've opened up porting and stuff in that area. And that did a lot of work and that kind of stuff. Uh, like the 560s, they had trouble with the uh, head gaskets blown out in between the sleeves and stuff. And if you've got the newer style sleeves, the heavy press fit, with the fi uh, uh, increased fire dam. The yep. fire dam is the uh, top of the sleeve where the piston, where the head is meeting with the crankcase and stuff like yep. this here. And they got that all corrected and stuff. So uh, you really don't have much trouble with the 656 is in that problem. Now, another thing that was a little bit that happened to them is the 560s, when they come out, they got turned up that they're trying to pull more power than what they're supposed to. Yep. Overheating the engine, that was another big thing to them. Yep. Well, they they were uh, king of the hill for a little bit, and then Deer came out with that 4010, and it was... Yeah, it did. Yeah. And, yeah. and it Yeah, kept. we... There, for a while, we had everything over anybody. Yeah. with that and then when that happened yeah they just went the wrong way for us but um somebody you know it's kind of funny um harold lindstrom kevin's dad yeah had a 560 turboed and they said that the turbo actually helped it would engine. actually what what happened there is you could take and put a turbocharger on them and they would actually run cooler because they weren't dumping as much fuel in. Okay. And they would run cooler. Because they had the, IH actually offered a kit. Yes, they did. The kit come uh, from the industrial portion of I, of International Harvester, like the payloaders and stuff like that. And they made a kit from those and put them on them. Okay, okay. So yeah, that's, it's interesting. You think well, the last thing that tractor would want is more power, but it actually. Yeah. Well, you'd, you'd pick up some power, yeah, but it just kept the engine running much, much cooler. Yep, yep, so that's pretty interesting. And this six, you said that's original paint and everything? Yes. Okay, and this was sold new at Balls? Yes. Okay, and she's a, you said 69? Uh, 70. It is 70, okay, okay. So yeah, well she can't be a gold demo because she's gear drive. <laughs> yeah, gear drive. All right, well, 
Yeah, so looking back at it, you wouldn't have done things any different. And you had a pretty good career then. Yeah. 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 You know. It was my whole life. Yeah. That's yeah. a that's a cool thing to to have seen, you know, and you know, and something you're not gonna see anymore. But uh yeah, imagine being able to pick up a you know, a turbocharged uh fifty six series and a hemi cart or same spot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You can do all of that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So. All right. Well, thanks, Jerry. You bet. Thank you.